Hi there, and welcome everyone today to our webinar on traceability, transparency, and disclosure. My name is Julia. I am a project manager at Elevate based in Hong Kong, um, and Elevate is the secretariat of the Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition. So for those who are new and haven't joined one of our webinars before, the HKSSC um, is a industry coalition um, of members aiming to advance sustainable seafood through good sourcing practices. The HKSSC offers a practical and collaborative way to demonstrate good sourcing practices uh, by committing to voluntary codes on responsible seafood sourcing. Really, the intention is for all seafood imported into Hong Kong to be legal, traceable, and biologically sustainable. So with this, uh, the technical advisor and myself are putting together a series of webinars to work with our members uh, on this vision. Um, so just quickly, a little bit of housekeeping before we kick off into the webinar. Uh, a quick note that all slides will be shared upon request. Um, and the second thing to note is that when the Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood meetings and webinars are run, we do so with Chatham House rules. So what that means for today is for any, to protect the identity of any of our, any of the people who are attending and would like to ask a question, um, for asking questions, please type into the webinar platform and I or the technical advisor will read out your questions for the panelists without disclosing your identity. So please don't be shy and do ask your questions today. Um, so with this, uh, oh, sorry, one more piece. <laughs> um, just wanted to show you a current snapshot of some of our Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood members. Um, we have more than a dozen members and a few more actually coming on board this week. Uh, some logos are, you know, our members are in the room today and for others, maybe you might be sourcing or, or know one of these companies. And what I'd really like to emphasize is Joining the Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition offers a risk-free way to start improving your seafood supply chain. So if you're interested to learn more about our membership or have any questions, uh, please contact the Secretariat and you'll probably already have my email by now. If not, you'll get one as a follow-up to this, to this webinar. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Jackie Dixon. Jackie is the technical advisor of the Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition, and she will introduce our speakers who will kick us off today. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks so much, Julia, and, and welcome everyone to this webinar today. Um, so as Julia mentioned, when we first established the coalition in early 2018, we have been running these types of webinars for our members. Um, but during this very challenging period of COVID-19 um, and with more and more people working from home these days, we decided that it was a good idea to perhaps open up our webinars beyond our membership just to help raise capacity and awareness more broadly in the Hong Kong market and the Asia region uh, on important issues facing seafood buyers and traders. And in some ways, um, this COVID situation may in fact be an opportunity for us to focus more attention uh, on the provenance of our seafood um, and the types of uh, information that we request down our, our supply chains. So uh, the topic today is on uh, traceability, transparency and disclosure. We all know that in Hong Kong we consume a lot of seafood. Uh, per capita, Hong Kong ranks second in terms of seafood consumption in Asia. It's the world's eighth largest seafood consumer overall. So seafood is an incredibly important food source for Hong Kong and around 95% of the seafood consumed uh, in Hong Kong is actually imported and that equates to around 3 billion uh, US dollars worth. So this topic is very relevant uh, for the Hong Kong market, um, especially considering the high import rate and the importance of knowing um, the state of the fisheries, where the fish is coming from, uh, importers import from all over the world, including Southeast Asian countries, places like Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. We have seafood coming from those countries. Uh, also countries like Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, France, and the USA, some of the major markets, uh, importing markets for Hong Kong. 
We also know that illegal and unreported and unregulated fishing, known as IUU, continues to be a fundamental issue facing the global industry. Um, and this does prevent governments and regional fisheries management organizations from achieving sustainable fisheries uh, outcomes. So hence the importance of uh, this topic today on traceability, transparency and disclosure. Um, our codes of conduct do require our members to conduct risk assessments on their supply chains, including screening against IUU and assessing traceability, as well as assessing the biological sustainability of the fish source. And so today we're going to hear about the Ocean Disclosure Project um, and we're going to see how we can get more Asian companies involved in disclosing more about their seafood supply chains. And then we'll also be hearing about the Global Dialogue on Seafood Traceability, which just recently launched its first 1.0 standard on traceability for seafood supply chains. So very hot off the press. And we have three speakers with us today. Our first two speakers are from the Sustainable Fisheries Partnership. We have Blake Lee Harwood, who will provide an overview of the work of the SFP. And then his colleague, Tanya Woodcock, will go into the details of the Ocean Disclosure Project. And our third speaker today is Susan Roxas, dialing in from the Philippines. And she's from the Global Dialogue on Seafood Traceability. So let's first turn to the work of the Ocean Disclosure Project and SFP. Uh, Blake Lee Harwood is the Programs Division Director at the Sustainable Fisheries Partnership. Uh, he leads SFP's Strategy, Communications and Analysis Division. And then Tanya Woodcock is currently managing the Ocean Disclosure Project for the SFP. Uh, she also provides support on social issues in fisheries, including research into human trafficking, forced labor, and hazardous child labor in global seafood supply chains. So we have some great expertise with us today. So I'm going to now hand over to Blake, who will kick off first, and just give us an overview of the SFP. Thanks, Blake. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. And um, and I won't speak for very long, but I'll um, I'll just do a short introduction about SFP, and then we'll we'll get on to the the meat of the subject with uh, Tanya. So. Sustainable Fisheries Partnership was founded in 2007 um, and it's a virtual organization. It has no headquarters. Um, it has 60 staff around the world. We all basically work from laptops from home um, and we have been living on Skype and Zoom and virtual webinars pretty much for, well, for the last decade. So this is fairly a, a familiar environment for us. We are a business facing NGO although we're mainly funded by foundations, but we get about 10% of our income from industry. And we partner with companies that are essentially significant players in the seafood industry, whether they're producers or, or retailers or processors. And our partners include uh, McDonald's globally, uh, Walmart, uh, Disney, uh, Nestle, uh, Tesco in the UK where I come from uh, and many others. Um, so a lot of big names that have chosen to be our, our partners in the journey towards seafood sustainability. And we work with industry really through two stages. Firstly, through evaluating the, sustain the sustainability of source fisheries that are used by companies. And we have a number of uh, dedicated tools to do that the most important of which is Fish Source, which is a, a global database of fisheries, which contains a, a lot of sort of hard metrics around how well fisheries are managed. Um, and once we've evaluated the supply chains for companies, we then work with them on prioritizing those fisheries that need the most attention. Um, and then we, we help the supply chain to fix the problems in problematic fisheries, uh, usually through a, a template approach, which we call fishery improvement projects, which are essentially multi-stakeholder groups uh, that dig in to the problems in specific fisheries and hammer out the problems um, and ideally uh, make progress and reports on that progress via another website. So we have several principles which underpin our work. Um, and one of them, perhaps one of the most important, is that we, we very much believe in improvement 
uh, and improving fisheries that are perhaps less well managed or poorly managed. Uh, we definitely don't recommend that companies start deleting bad fisheries from their sourcing. Uh, we don't think that helps to improve fisheries. Uh, we think that companies should identify the fisheries they buy from that uh, perform least well and that they should then engage in the improvement process of making those fisheries better. So we very much believe in engagement and not, uh, and not boycotting or, or deleting. Another principle that underlies our work is transparency. Um, and we are passionate about the need for openness and transparency in the seafood supply chain within the boundaries of commercial confidentiality. Um, we encourage all of our partners to fully disclose where they get their fish from. We think that's completely reasonable. We think anyone, any consumer who buys a fish in a, a supermarket or, or a restaurant uh, could reasonably ask, you know, where does this fish come from? And they should expect a decent answer. Um, so we work around the transparency platform by encouraging our partners to fully disclose. And that's why we created the Ocean Disclosure Project, which is started off for our partners, but is in fact available as a platform for, for all companies that have seafood within their supply chain. So Tanya is the project manager for the ODP and is the expert um, in a way that I'm not, um, and has overseen its development for the past three years when it's gone from perhaps two or three companies up to now 26, with perhaps another five or six shortly to join in the next few months. Um, and at this point, I'm going to hand over to Tanya, who's going to explain how the Ocean Disclosure Project works. Brilliant. Thanks, Blake. Excellent to get an overview of the SFP there. Um, and yeah, looking forward to hearing some more about the Ocean Disclosure Project. Go ahead, Tanya. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, as has already been said, I've been managing the Ocean Disclosure Project for a few years now. Um, so if I can just move my slide onwards. There we go. So firstly, I'd like to give you an overview about the importance of transparency and introduce you to the Ocean Disclosure Project. Sorry, just waiting for the slides to change. So what is transparency? Well, we're talking about Transparency for business is about communicating information to your stakeholders, whether that's your customers, your suppliers, investors, and NGOs even, so they can better understand how you operate and what the impacts of your business are. Being transparent enables those groups to make informed buying or investment decisions. For example, environmental disclosures can help investors to understand the environmental risks and opportunities within your supply chain. Transparency also enables those groups to hold businesses accountable for their decisions and to make sure that they are working towards their commitments. So SFP established the Ocean Disclosure Project in 2015 with the aim of delivering greater transparency in global seafood supply chains to advance the goal of sustainably produced seafood. The project encourages seafood buying companies like retailers and suppliers to voluntarily disclose the fisheries and the farms that they buy seafood from. We provide a simple way for companies to disclose their sources through a common reporting profile that identifies where species are caught or produced, along with environmental information about those sources. Profiles are then published on our website where they can be freely accessed by anyone interested in sustainable seafood. Participation in the project has grown significantly since its launch in 2015, when the first wild caught disclosures were published by a handful of companies. In 2017, we launched the ODP website with nine participating companies, including Walmart US, and to date, 26 companies from across Europe, North America, and Australia have participated in the project. In the UK, where the project was first started, more than 60% of all seafood retailed in the country is now covered by the programme, 
We hope to continue growing support in new regions and sectors like food service. So if I can move on to how to disclose and the process involved in creating a profile. So what is typically reported in an ODP disclosure? Where well, each profile is specific to a company and contains one year's worth of sourcing data for that company. They are retrospective, so the 2020 profiles that are now being published contain sourcing information for 2019. We are focused on asking companies to disclose the origin of their wild caught seafood, namely the species and fisheries where they're caught. And last year, UK retailer Asda actually chose to publish vessel information alongside its fishery list as part of its update. They shared vessel names, IMO numbers and countries of origins for the fishing vessels that supply their stores with cod, haddock and plaice. And they plan to publish vessel information for more of their own brand products in the future. And we hope that other companies will follow their lead. In 2019, the first disclosures to include farm species were published and several companies now disclose both wild caught and farm species. Alongside the source list, there is space for companies to report information on things like their seafood policy and sustainability commitments, engagement with initiatives like the Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition and involvement in fishery improvement projects. So when it comes to developing a disclosure with the ODP, it's a relatively simple process. Each year, we ask companies to submit their source list for the previous year. We take the list and combine it with publicly available information on the environmental performance of those fisheries and farms. The company then has the opportunity to review their draft profile and check that the source information is correct. Then when they've approved the profile, we agree a date for publication and the profile is published on the ODP website. So the next few slides are intended to give you an idea of what a profile looks like. A profile has three main areas. The first one being a highlight summary of your seafood sourcing with background information about the company. The second component is an interactive map of your seafood sources. This gives a global overview of where your seafood comes from. And the third and main component is an item by item table showing your sources with corresponding environmental information. Within the source table, there are five main elements. First, there is species and location. Secondly, production methods, which covers fishing gear types or if a species is farmed. The third column shows whether a source is third party certified, for example, MSC certified, or linked to a, an improvement project. In the fourth column, we provide sustainability ratings from a range of different organizations, including SFP's own fish loss website, and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch ratings. Then lastly, we provide brief environmental notes on the impact of the fishery or farm sources covering issues such as habitat impacts and bycatch and um, impacts on water quality and farming. So as well as sharing company profiles produced by the ODP, we also recognize the efforts of companies that have disclosed through other approaches. Companies that choose to prepare their own disclosures are also invited to share them through the ODP website. So why participate in the ODP and what are the benefits specifically of disclosing? Businesses are now expected to take action on environmental issues and to report on how they are doing so. But very few companies actively disclose information like seafood sourcing on a regular basis. The Ocean Disclosure Project is the only platform that I know of to bring together seafood disclosures from a range of companies, and we aim to be the global resource for sharing disclosures. Disclosing through the ODP positions your company as a leader in the field and can enhance your reputation. It can help to differentiate you from other companies, which may even provide you with a competitive edge when it comes to buyers and consumers purchasing decisions. Disclosing allows you to showcase your commitment to transparency and to communicate your good practices to others. It helps you to promote the actions that you have taken to improve unsustainable fisheries and to reach your responsible sourcing targets. The simple metrics used in the ODP enable you to share information easily with customers, colleagues, NGOs, media, and any other interested stakeholders. 
Disclosing can also help to facilitate collaboration with other industry members in promoting responsible fishing and farming practices. And overall can help support progress towards the sustainable development goals. Producing the disclosure can also be beneficial to your own internal review processes. Our profiles can serve as a way of benchmarking performance year on year to help companies identify where they are doing well and where they can do better. The process of producing a disclosure can also act as a, con a catalyst for conversations with your suppliers that can lead to a better oversight of your supply chain, enabling companies to better understand environmental risks and to push for improvements where they are required. Since the project's launch in 2015, the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive and we've received support from ocean advocacy groups like Greenpeace, as well as responsible investors. Information reported through the ODP has actually been used by other NGOs to support their data gathering and assessments of companies, with participating companies recognised positively for their good performance. Our participants, both new and old, have praised the project and attribute significant value to transparency and to seafood disclosures. And with that, I'm finished. So thank you for listening and please do reach out with any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tanya. That was very clear um, and also very exciting. Um, and I do encourage all of our Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition members and others on the call to go and visit the Ocean uh, Disclosure Project website and you'll get a really good feel for how the information is presented um, and also how non-threatening it is. Often, I think people might feel a little bit cautious of being so open and disclosing their supply chains to the world. Um, but when you go to the website, you realize actually it is a step-by-step -step process and um, you know you start somewhere and you gradually expand and how valuable this process is in terms of helping you get clarity on your own supply, supply chain and perhaps if you are challenged on one or two species then that just helps you to move faster and improve that supply chain um, so I see it as a very valuable uh, opportunity area um, we'll keep uh, questions until the end um, so any questions you have for Tanya or um, for Blake, please put it into the chat box and we're going to be monitoring that. Um, for now, let's turn to the global uh, dialogue on seafood traceability. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Susan Roftus. So Susan is the Asia Pacific lead for the GDST and she works very closely with seafood companies on this industry led discussion. So uh, Susan, please tell us more about the GDST and how we can all get involved. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's afternoon in, in Manila today. Um, my name is Susan Ross, and I'm leading the Global Dialogue on Seafood Traceability for the Asia Pacific region. Um, and I'm also on the core team of WWF's Coral Triangle program. So I wear two hats with WWF. And I'll be introducing the Global Dialogue on Seafood Traceability, which uh, recently released their version 1.0 of standards and guidelines uh, uh, that's now available for company adoption. Oops. Okay. Let's see. Right, so this is a very interesting photo. It is a landing situation in General Santos. So if everybody, if any of you know uh, what it's like in General Santos, which is the main tuna landing um, port uh, in the Philippines, it is quite um, chaotic, right? It's, it's really quite complex. So traceability, this to make the point is, uh, to, to make the point that traceability, although much needed, um, is actually a, a very complex, um, uh, process. Um, however, uh, the global dialogue, which is industry-led, is a pre-competitive platform uh, where companies have gotten together uh, behind a voluntary standard for interoperable seafood traceability. So interoperable is, of course, uh, a key word. So um, transparent supply chains, it uh, the, the reasons for uh, traceability, I mean, I, I don't even have to go over them because everybody uh, is very much supportive of the reasons. It's to combat um, IUU, unreported and unregulated fishing. Uh, it removes um, the opportunities for fraud and mislabeling. 
and then it verifies your corporate sustainability policies and, and commitments. And then, of course, it responds to uh, risk management, both and, and uh, marketing uh, requirements, as a lot of customers now want to know where their seafood comes from. So traceability is happening. The drivers are are here. The good, I mean, there's um, all the stakeholders in a supply chain are looking for traceability. Consumers want to know more. Uh, regulators are are becoming more defined, and regulations are becoming more defined. And um, uh, EU and the US have very fixed um, uh, harvest. I'm um, sorry, um, import control rules, and Japan is coming along as well. Uh, companies. Um, definitely want uh, uh, traceability for various reasons that we, we've talked about before, um, risk management, um, uh, procurement policies, um, and of course the fishers surprisingly want uh, traceability as well because it provides them access to markets. So alongside the strong drive for traceability, uh, the GDST has worked to make it highly beneficial for the seafood industry through things like enabling full chain transparency, but not mandating it, promoting data reliability and verification. Verification, I think, is, is very much the key here, and driving down the costs and raising the returns on investments for companies implementing the GDST standards. So focus of the standards are interoperable. How do we transfer data? across multiple stakeholders on a supply chain and across multiple systems uh, operated by the stakeholders. And then how do we verify that data? Because as we all know, data is only as good as uh, its credibility, right? Um, so very quickly, uh, GDST has uh, grown from 2017. We were 30 members, uh, launch, uh, a launch meeting in Bangkok, and today we're over 70 companies, <clears throat> sorry. Um, uh, industry players uh, that are members of the GDST. One of the most significant, I think, is uh, that the CBOS, and, and I'm sure you've all heard about um, uh, the CBOS, 10 businesses, of, 10 of the largest companies have gotten together uh, to commit to stewarding um, the ocean resources uh, along five main work streams. And of course, IUU and traceability are uh, key mainstreams, and they have um, uh, had a joint communication with the GDST saying that they will uh, they will adopt the outcomes and the output of the GDST and we're beginning to work with the CBOS companies precisely to adopt the version one and implement version 1.0. So uh, the membership is uh, represents uh, across the, the, the regions very well represented. Uh, Asia has the highest, uh, interesting to know um, because this is really a, a big production uh, region. Um, we're also very well represented across the supply chain uh, with um, a lot uh, quite heavy on the mid-chain actors, um, uh, processors, uh, but also well represented by uh, small-scale fishers as well as uh, commercial fishers and then the large uh, brand owners and retailers. So the dialogue structure very quickly. Um, so members, when they join, they choose either to be engaged in the dialogue discussions or not engaged at all, but receive information. So if you want to be engaged, then you can opt to join three of the working groups. Um, uh, so the first one is defining key data elements uh, and looking at verify um, uh, uh, verification best practice of these data elements. The second one is what is the IT architecture uh, um, uh, required for interoperability, what are the specifications for data transfer? And the third is, how do we engage governments um, on regulatory issues? So very quickly, again, we've been, uh, we have face-to-face -face meetings, we had virtual meetings, uh, uh, um, very many meetings with all the members uh, since over the past three years to put the standards together. It was a lot of work, uh, but it's paying off. Um, so interoperability, what does it mean in practice? Um, so it means systems speaking the same language. So what, are we answering the same questions? So the what, who, how, and where, and are we using the same formats um, for the data? Right? And then are we uh, uh, are the data names and and uh, um, definitions uh, clear and shared 
So we're really looking at what are the fundamentals of a traceability system. And then for your IT connections, predictable formats, is it based on a global globalized standard for data exchange? And then it should be flexible among platforms. So we are totally systems agnostic. Okay, we just want to make sure that the right formats are used so that it can be read across different systems. So these are the two main um, uh, components of, of the standard. What it does not mean is that one size fits all solution. We do not, as I said, we are systems agnostic. Um, we are, uh, there's no loss of confidentiality or control of the data. And then we're open access for data. So we are, are the, the, the version 1.0 um, uh, is actually on the GitHub, um, which is an open source platform and open to anybody wanting to develop further on, on the Dialogues uh, version 1.0 standard. So these are just a list of the KDEs is wild capture, but we also have performed uh, uh, KDEs. And uh, this is an example of, um, of the list of KDEs that you can access. I could send the link um, uh, through our website. Um, it's launched to the public now, so everybody can access it. So we're looking at uh, names, same names shared, common names shared for each of the KDEs, um, the definitions, so we make sure they're not ambiguous definitions, and then the standard data options, how are the formats, and then where can we uh, find these data options, for example, IMO numbers, for example. Um, and which registry, and then very important, who are the author or what are the authorized data sources for each of the, the data elements? So very, uh, very important. Um, and then also the data uh, is, we're using what we call an events-based events um, traceability uh, structure. So we critical tracking events identify when in the supply chain key data elements need to be captured um, and um, and when when they should be generated, identifying where in the supply chain key data, data elements and who should be capturing them, as you can see from this from this table. So it's very well uh, outlined uh, where they're generated, who should generate them um, for the critical tracking events. And traceability really is connecting different critical tracking events like a vessel catch, a land, a landing event transport events, transformation events, aggregating events tra um, uh, uh, that, is, um, uh, that happens all along the supply chain. And then for interoperability, we've had a series of what we call hackathons um, to look at key challenges um, that uh, our members experienced uh, you know, in digital uh, traceability. And then we had um, uh, hackathons where um, uh, groups of developers or, or developers came to try and, and find solutions uh, for the for these challenges, and it was quite interesting because several very very interesting products um, that reach out to small scale fishers, you know, the last the first mile, sorry, in a in a traceability uh, process, um, solutions for that because that was seen as the most difficult. Um, for capturing the, the the data needed to for the traceability uh, process to begin, so we're different most multiple use cases uh, uh, we've looked at enabling interoperable digital capture on small scale vessels and farms, linking pallet case identifiers with downstream systems. Uh, we uh, basically use the ETCIS, uh, which is a business language um, uh, used by GS1, and I'm sure you all know about the GS1 um, system, um, but uh, the standard uses GS1 or non-GS1 identifiers, and then it can be put on the blockchain, um, very interoperable with blockchain, and then it links um, uh, legacy ERP systems with um, new systems and then also uh, enabling digital chain of custody certification. So there, that's um, pretty much it. Um, there are a lot of uh, uh, return on investment opportunities, obviously cost savings for, for digital uh, traceability, although I'm very aware that in this region, there's a, um, a majority of uh, the traceability uh, that occurs is actually paper-based. Right, so um, we have to look at eventually digitizing, helping small-scale fishers and uh, uh, governments digitize the, uh, that first mile, because a lot of the processors and uh, uh, downstream are um, are digital. Uh, so improving operational efficiencies, business intelligence, uh, and then reducing risk. 
So right now, uh, uh, as of the launch, we have 34 brands and, and industry associations that have committed to adopting uh, the standard. Um, we also have uh, parallel uh, initiatives that are working with us and have also adopted uh, the standard. And then we have about uh, 18 systems providers that are GDSD ready um, and, uh, and, and ready to work with corporations. Uh, and we're welcoming more um, if, uh, service providers that need help in, in setting up the system. So there are some uh, some questions that have often been asked. Is it um, G GS1 standard? Does it mean a company has to comply with all of them immediately? Uh, no, not at all. Adopting the standards means that you, we, you will commit to a time-bound uh, implementation, um, uh, but no specific uh, timeline or action for implementation. Uh, if, because we understand there is a whole management and um, IT process that has to happen within companies, right? Whether or not you have internal systems or if you're working with a software vendor. Um, does it support compliance with SIMP and EU? It definitely does. Um, does it mean the GDSD is done with its work? No, this is a work in progress. This is a live document. We see the GDSD version one evolving to other versions as technology um, uh, changes. I think the second version will probably start looking at verification best practice. How do we use technology to verify the data linking to uh, critical databases, um, government licensed databases, for example, uh, for farm, aquaculture farms, um, uh, or um, uh, uh, fishing vessel uh, licensed databases, uh, etc. So it is not, definitely not um, uh, the last version. And how is the GDSD verified compliance claims? Uh, we are actually working with our steering committee, about 13 industry members are on the committee, and we're exploring options for uh, verification uh, and compliance. Uh, so there, that's pretty much it. Um, thank you for your attention. It's a lot of information. And here is my email in case you you have more questions, and also the, the, the link to the the URL for the traceability, the, for the GDST, if you want to find out more and adopt the standard. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. <clears throat> very, very good. Thank you. Um, and uh, just fantastic to have this opportunity to have somebody like you um, present to us on the GDST, because I know how incredibly busy you are. And it's phenomenal to see that in such a short period of time, 70 companies are now supporting the commitment to implement GDST. Um, and I think it's just very important to point out to everyone on the webinar um, that you know, don't get scared off by terms like interoperability and the technical side of the GDST, um, because this is very much a step-by-step -step process as well. And um, from discussions I've had with Susan, paper-based uh, traceability is still very much the norm. Um, and it's about transitioning eventually down the line to, to digital. And this is what the GDST can help with, but also defining what do you need to collect information on. And their key data elements, KDEs, are very aligned to the Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition Code of Conduct, which is really good and it's really useful for us to know that there's a technical standard now available to help you implement this. Um, so we're going to open up now to questions and we do have a question already um, from Julia's informed me uh, first for the uh, global ocean disclosure and then we're going to come back to the GDST. Julia, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Thank you, Jackie. So we did have a question come through while Tanya was speaking. So let me first ask the question to Tanya and then Susan, if you'd like to add anything to it, by all means. So the first question here is around um, third party certification and, and how does this contribute? So the question itself is, how would this be different, say, to sourcing MSC certified seafood? Sorry, I'm not quite sure that I understand the question. Blake, do you, do you know what is meant? Can you repeat the question, please? Just Sure. So I think the question is talking about how I would interpret it. It's written, how is this different, say, to sourcing MSC fish? And in my thought, it's then, you know, how, how, um, there's some drilling in the backyard, sorry. Um, how could ocean disclosure projects maybe complement um, 
as how would you report maybe on a seafood that is already MSC certified? Um, would there be a different type of mechanism, or or how would that work under ODP? Sure, it's it's the, it's essentially the same um, because we do. There is a uh, <clears throat> one of the information columns um, identifies whether a fishery is certified or not, um, and the and the certification status basically it's a it's a yes or no. Um, it's either certified or it's not certified, and the certifications we recognise are those that meet the benchmark of the um, GSSI, the Global Sustainable Seafood Initiative, um, and that is essentially for wild fisheries would be MSC, uh, the Alaska Responsible Fisheries Management Scheme, and the Icelandic Responsible Fisheries Management Scheme. So if you're certified to any of those three, then you will be, the fishery itself will be described as certified within an ODP profile. So it's possible for a company that completes the profile, you can then see very clearly how many of your fisheries are certified, um, along with all the other data that's contained within the profile. So yeah, they're, 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 they're completely complementary and one describes the other. I don't know, Tanya, is there anything you'd like to add on that? No, that was great. Thanks, Blake. Yeah, I think that's pretty clear, Blake. Um, you'd have, yeah, you, you, the, the website would help you to disclose what's certified product and what is not certified. And, and perhaps another follow-up question from me then, uh, just for clarity purposes, would you encourage companies to disclose all of their supply chain? So even if it's not certified, um, and even if, for example, fish profile hasn't been completed online by another second or third party tool, would you still encourage them to disclose all and um, and and work towards finding out more information about the supply chain, or would you rather wait until you have that information before making it public? I think um, I'll ask Tanya to comment in a sec, but I think from from an SAP point of view, we we would encourage full disclosure on the basis of whatever information you have to hand, um, and consider it. Consider it a journey, as it were, in terms of being able to, you know, start with a, a landscape assessment of your own sourcing and think about, you know, identify the fisheries where you have a lot of information and also those where you have less and identify the fisheries which are doing really well and those which are perhaps doing less well. Um, and we have a, a set of tools to help you go through this process. And then once that exercise is complete, um, it's, we recommend a, a full disclosure um, and then also followed by a work plan to address the biggest priorities um, that have been identified as that process and, and a way of you know, stimulating fishery improvement projects or, or whatever is decided. So we, we generally support complete openness and better to have a bit of data than a lot of data. We don't see the ODP is just a showcase for people to talk about, you know, only the certified fisheries that they have. That that's not the purpose of it. But it's, it's as a tool to to it's a full disclosure transparency tool which shows the whole range of potential impacts, but also the the whole range of opportunities for for improving the situation, which are usually many. But Tanya, you, you have, I mean, you deal with these issues every day. So what's your view? Yeah, so exactly the same in that um, we would expect companies or we would encourage a company to disclose fully where possible. We do understand that sometimes this isn't practical um, across the whole range of products that they're sourcing. So in some cases, a company might choose to disclose a particular segment, for example, fresh and frozen product from their own brand range. If that's the case, we would ask that company to clearly state that in the profile so that it's viewable by anyone looking at the profile. We would not um, encourage any company to disclose only the sustainable product within their supply chain. That is kind of going against the point of the project, really. The whole point of it, yeah. No, I get that, exactly. It's about helping people move towards that sustainability. 
Um, okay, that's very clear. Thanks for answering that question. We have some more questions coming in. Uh, Julie, I'm going to hand back to you to ask them. Sure. So I have um, I have one from from a member here around uh, the platforms from uh, SFP. So the question I'll just read out to you is: SFP hosts Fish Source, which provides environmental information on source fisheries. Um, so our Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition's members buy many species which aren't currently assessed on fish source or any other platform. So would an ODP for an HKSSC member company contain blanks or, uh, you know, what kind of recommendations would SFP have on how to overcome this so that we can work to address issues and make improvements in the source fisheries? Yeah, it's um, that is a, a constant difficulty that we face in that it's very hard to it's very hard to build a database that covers every single fishery, um, and so we tend to be led by the fisheries that are sourced by our partners. And so, because when we started, our partner base tended to be in North America and Europe there is a, a bias towards fisheries that are important to those markets. Um, and, we, and we have less coverage in some parts of the world and, and for sure in Asia, we're missing uh, many fisheries. What we would say is that um, firstly, uh, if you're interested in assessing your sourcing, reviewing your sourcing, we would love to work with you to identify your fisheries and then see what we can do to organize fish source profiles being created uh, so that's something we 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 want to keep identifying new fisheries and building new fish source profiles so that's something we definitely like to explore and also that fish source is not the only source of data uh, that's used in the OTP we also rely on other databases as well where we can access them which can provide information and sometimes uh, where we have a blank on fish source uh, we can fill in the data from another source so i think this isn't the straight answer to the question except to say that we're very flexible um, we're keen to access credible data from anywhere we can get it um, and we're certainly very interested in trying to expand our coverage in asia so I guess that's a conversation to be had. So I, I would um, I'd encourage uh, your participants to get in touch and, and see what we can do. Thanks, Blake. Um, that's that's really nice to know that um, we could potentially work with Fish Source on that because uh, at the Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition, we do have a working group called the Sustainability Risk Assessment Working Group where we're coming up with um, risk profiles for, uh, in terms of sustainability aspects for the fish, um, the fisheries plus the farms, um, farmed regions by country level. Um, so far, we've only got about nine profiles on wild catch um, and equivalent on farmed. Um, but going forward, we're gonna have to increasingly work with organizations like yourself. So maybe we can even see the HKSSC risk rating being profiled on your website as part of that decision making as well, which would be yeah, great. Yeah, absolutely, perfectly possible. Yeah. Great, Wait, Julia. I think you've got another question. Yeah, there are a few more questions. Let me hand one over to Susan here. Um, this is about the different types of data that's um, collected. So one here would be: Are you tracking different types of data specifically on the gear used? or any data related to loss of gear, so such as ghost nets? Right, that's interesting. Uh, yes, we do have a key data element on the standard uh, on gear. So we go with the FAO gear types. Uh, that would be the, the, the standard data option would be the FAO gear type. Uh, but we do not have actually any indication about um, uh, gear that has been discarded. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was the question, right? How do you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I understood. Um, because I understand, you know, we, we all know that um, uh, ghost gear, as they call it, is, is a real problem. Um, what we do have though, and going back to the first question on MSC, is we have a KDE on 
um, some sustainability uh, indicators like uh, is this is the, the the product certified? Is there a chain of custody certification? Not necessarily MSC; it can be any certification. Um, and is it part? Uh, has it been sourced from a FIP or uh, an agriculture improvement program? And then we also have so um, we also have um, a social key data element. Um, this is very very difficult because uh, you know social. Um, um, evaluating whether a supply chain has been subjected to a human welfare audit is very difficult. You would need, it's difficult to capture in few KDEs and nobody wants a very long list of key data elements. So, uh, so this is a work in progress, uh, as we said before. Um, but no, we do not have anything that indicates uh, any reference to, to ghost gear, but um, we're hoping that um, some of the, um, the you know, benchmarked uh, certification schemes would eventually integrate that into their criteria for sustainability. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks, Susan. And I suppose you're going to be working quite closely uh, with those standard setters as this evolves, um, working hand in hand so that everything links up eventually. You know, it's all, all working towards the same direction. Right. Actually, it would be, you know, and I'll, I'll get in touch with Blake and Tanya later because it would be interesting to see, are you, um, or have you disclosed uh, via the ocean uh, disclosure project? You know, could that be part of the, a, a response to KDE, for example? Uh, is that a question to, to Blake or Tanya uh, in terms of <laughs> oh, is sorry, yeah. both here? I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that's a conversation we'd love to have, Susan. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, yeah. Let's, definitely, let's definitely talk, you know, at some point, yeah, in the near future, because I think that there are so many synergies between our, our work that we definitely should explore the overlaps and what we can yeah. do together in the future. Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Thanks. Excellent Thank question. You. Thank you. Mm. There's a few more, Jackie, that have come in. Um, Susan, you mentioned just now that there are some data points on social issues. Um, and there is a question that actually came in specifically for Tanya on this. Um, you did mention earlier that you do some works, I believe, in, in the social in the social space. Um, and there's a question that comes in around um, if there's any efforts currently from Ocean Disclosure Project or more broadly with SFP on some efforts to address modern slavery in, in seafood supply chains. Right, so SFP was actually involved in establishing the Seafood Slavery Risk Tool, um, which, which assesses the risk of human trafficking, forced labour and hazardous child labour in seafood supply chains. Um, so SFP was involved in setting that up and now that has become its own sort of standalone organisation and is currently going through a, a renewal process where a new methodology behind that system has been created and is currently being tested on a tropical tuna supply chain. Um, in terms of the Ocean Disclosure Project, right now, as you will have seen, we don't incorporate any social information, but it's something that we're interested in and we're thinking about ways that we might be able to do that in the future. But right now, there isn't any one, for example, easy rating that we could apply across all fisheries and farm products to go into a profile. So one of the ways that companies that currently participate do give information on social is to talk about um, in the summary section where they have some text about themselves, they might include some information on what that company is doing to address social issues in their own supply chain. Thank Very you. clear. Mm. Can I say Right. Um, so a very interesting thing about uh, the, the members of the Global Dialogue, you know, even as WWF, we were not pushing um, sustainability or social issues. We wanted a traceability system, right? So working with the, with the Global Food Traceability Center of the IFT, uh, we wanted traceability fundamentally because you cannot be sustainable unless you're traceable. So let's go step by step, right? Um, but it was the members, you know, the industry members who asked for sustainability KDEs and social KDEs. So our social KDs, as Tanya said, you know, it's, 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 it's very difficult to, to capture and it's still a work in progress. It asks the question, has your supply chain been um, audited, right? And um, is it um, 
by an audit uh, that has been benchmarked by uh, TS TSSI, for example. So it's just like two or three questions uh, on social. But however, uh, we are working very closely with um, a lot of um, uh, organizations like the Consumer Goods Forum, et cetera, that have uh, put together, that are working on social issues, you know, just to see how we can uh, capture adequately um, you know the the how this how you know has there been sl been slavery uh, in the supply chain? Is there forced or 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 child labor? Uh, you know, eventually um, the questions to be asked are going to be: Is there equity in the supply chain? So you know the, you, you're going to start seeing um, uh, uh, equity uh, uh, questions, especially for the small scale fishers. So it's it's an interesting space that's changing all the time. It's really evolving you know, as um, technology uh, evolves and, and as, the, uh, as the situation evolves. And I'm sure after the COVID lockdowns, uh, there will be fresh issues uh, or maybe old issues that were ignored before that are now going to come to light. It'll be an interesting time. <laughs> Absolutely, Susan, completely agree on that. Um, and I think the next burning question really for everyone on the call and for our Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition members is how do they get involved? What is the next logical step, for example, in terms of the GDST? Um, do you work closely with the company to help them step by step, almost like a hand holding exercise, or do you just send them the documents and say get on with it? What, what is the approach? <laughs> well, we. <laughs> We actually, we have a, um, a, an IT group that works with uh, members, but if, if a member, it depends, if you're working with um, uh, an internal IT staff in your company, um, we can work with your IT staff. And frankly, your IT staff will get it right away because it's really, uh, you know, all, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really not a complicated thing. All we say is these are the specs to be able to transfer data. And then if you're working with a service provider, a, a software developer, we can talk to your software developer and we're reaching out to a lot of software developers so they can get GDST ready. Uh, what we have done with our members is uh, looked at, um, they pick a supply chain um, uh, and then they give us historical data right and then we turn it into we put it into the the critical tracking event matrix and then put it into the formats uh whether it be uh it could also be uh data exchanged on excel formats um you know uh, uh i don't know i don't know all the names of these the, all the technical terms of the different formats but all the IT people are so familiar with it, so it should not be a problem for your IT people. And then we, we, we transfer it at each step of the supply chain to make sure that data can be read. And believe me, it's, it's, um, we can help you do that uh, uh, if, uh, if you ask for it. And okay. to sign up, very simple, uh, go into the website and you will, say, you will see become a member, uh, adopt the, the, the TDSD version one, and just name, contact, uh, person, et cetera, and that's it, super simple. Great, thanks, Susan. I know that our chair um, of the Hong Kong Sustainable Seafood Coalition, Benjamin So from 178 Degrees, has actually been through the pilot himself, um, and he was very positive about the uh, overall experience uh, and knowing that the capability now exists. So I think it's a great opportunity for members to explore that. Um, and also perhaps we can explore whether the HKSSC wants to endorse the GDST um, along similar lines to CBOS and other organizations. So um, let's, let's remain discussing, you know, just discussions on that. And uh, just to finish off for the Ocean Disclosure Project, um, how would you guys uh, expect members to get involved? What is the first step? Do they just approach you and uh, start the conversation or uh, anything you can recommend? on ensuring it happens. Yep, so exactly that. So firstly, just reach out to us. Um, our emails are on the, the slides, but also on the website, you can contact us via that. Um, and we can just sort of start the conversation to understand what kind of source data you already have. And perhaps if it's not quite there yet for reporting, um, we can help you understand how to improve it. Um, SFP has systems like metrics, for example, where you can have your suppliers report data into you. Um, and so we would work with you and perhaps, um, as you mentioned earlier, 
not all fisheries in the Asian market might have some of the environmental information like the ratings out there. It might be that we would find a way to adjust the profiles for that market so that we would sort of slightly change the information, for example, if the current ratings that we use aren't relevant to those markets. Um, as you mentioned, you've got some risk assessments that you're working on at the Sustainable Seafood Coalition. Perhaps we can look at including those in the future. Um, so we can be fairly flexible in terms of what goes into a profile, into an overall profile. So um, we can certainly discuss ways and it, you might find that the profile doesn't look exactly like the one. Um, you might, for example, on, as the, the UK profile that they've been doing for several years now, we might vary slightly from that. Um, the main thing really is to disclose the sources, so the origin, so different species and their origin where they're produced. And then ideally, if we can get the environmental information as well to go alongside that, then that's great. Brilliant. I love the step-by-step -step approach, and that's very much something that we would endorse. Um, and on that note, I think it's time we need to wrap up. Um, it has gone to the hour. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us um, on, on our webinar today. And um, if anybody would like to get in touch, then please contact Julia, our secretariat, uh, either for joining the coalition or just for finding out more about what we do. And I would just like to thank our three speakers, Susan, Blake, and Tanya. Thanks for being with us today and sharing your expertise. And very exciting to hear about these global initiatives that in Hong Kong we can get involved in as well. So let's hope we see more participation going forward. Thank you okay. for having us. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. okay. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, everyone.